This lecture has been made available to you courtesy of the American Numismatic Society. Uh, our speaker today is Dr. Andrew Reinhardt, uh, who is our director of publications. He started here at the ANS. He was reminding me eight years ago. Um, boy, how time flies, I tell you. Um, and he was saying that you can tell how time is flying by how gray our beards are getting. <laughs> so uh, back when we met each other almost a decade ago, um, there was a little bit more color there in both of our beards, but uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but uh, since he's been at the ANS, uh, he got his PhD and um, has established himself as essentially the father of archaeo gaming. And in fact, he published a book uh, called Archaeo Gaming with uh, Routledge a few years was, ago. I forget uh, yeah, Berg Bergheim. Sorry. Oh yeah, that, that's I've right. I've got another book um, for, with, with Routledge coming out uh, probably next that's week. That's it, that's it. So <laughs> he, he is very much an active researcher and uh, publisher, but not <laughs> necessarily in numismatics. Uh, although there there is a monetary connection. Until now. Um, right. Um, uh, so despite the fact that he's spent a great deal of time in the virtual world, the digital world, he tells me that he's been trying to pull back from the digital world a bit and um, get uh, a little bit more, more of a foothold in the real world by um, things like bagel making and pickle making and the rest of that. So he's been reducing his digital uh, footprint. Um, nevertheless, uh, some of his current research has to do with uh, the dark side of the digital economy. And so today he's going to be presenting on real money, virtual stuff, the porous economy of paying something for nothing. So Andrew, it's all yours. All right, uh, thank you, Peter, for that introduction. Uh, and thank you all for coming and for braving the uh, the digital sea uh, with me today. I'm gonna share my screen and uh, we'll go ahead and get started. Um, can you let me know, um, Emma or, or someone, if you can see my first slide? Looks perfect. Looks perfect. Okay. Um, so, uh, so yeah, um, Adam, you brought your kitty with you. And so we're going to start with crypto kitties here. Um, and we're going to be talking about um, all kinds of, of wonderful, horrible things um, and did dealing with uh, new digital economies, you know, over the past uh, five to 10 years. Um, so uh, I bet when you guys signed up for this that you did not expect to see a quote from Duran Duran kind of kept kicking things off, but little did they know in 1987 that they would be talking about uh, the skin trade, um, which is uh, what I'll be talking about today. And you know, when we're talking about skins, um, I'll be talking a little bit more, uh, well, actually for the book of the session on video game skins. And I wanted to, dis to define what those are, but for those traditional numismatists in the room, uh, let's look at something familiar first. Um, so you know that the uh, the old uh, you, you get into the etymology of where bucks come from. You know, so ten bucks, one buck, five bucks, or whatnot. And you know, there are these two schools of thought. Uh, the first is that bucks are just shortened form of buckskins. You know, which of course are used for trading, um, or they used to be. Uh, maybe they still are. Um, and then, of course, the other alternate term is the uh, sawbuck, um, and then bucks became an abbreviated form of that, which I think is the more preferred at a, you know uh, history uh, of where bucks come from, but. We're going to take a look at the buck skins uh, themselves, and so when we're talking about skins in this instance, um, you know the traders would you know shoot a deer, they would field dress it, they would treat the skins and the hide, um, they would soften it, um, and then you could either you know turn them in, you know just as you see them here, um, or you could make you know make them into clothes. So all of a sudden you've got something that's functional, something that's practical, and if you put a little bit of fringe on it fashionable. So, you know, we're starting off with skins here. These are you know, just tactile things, things that you can have, things that have practical use in the physical world. Well, what are skins in the digital world? Um, over the past, you know, 10, 15, maybe even 20 years, um, video games have come a long way in allowing players to customize what they uh, you know what they want to use uh, during gameplay and so you kind of start off as a game developer with looking at models and so what I'm showing you here are just kind of generic armaments um, you know for for a war game and there's nothing special about these you get the shape and they're all kind of battleship gray 
Um, however, uh, when you apply a skin, that basically is like putting clothes on or you know adding a fresh coat of paint or decoration. So you know, in this case, um, we're looking at Counter Strike Global Offensive knives, and you can see it's the same shape of um, of uh, uh, K bar uh, knife, but you're seeing all of these different skins. And that one that you see there that says case hardened, um, that is super, super valuable to players. And I want to talk about value um, because, you know, when you're when you're a player and you're playing these games, um, you can start off you know, with a mesh. You can start off with something with that's gray. And, and then, you know, you can start dressing yourself up. And so in this case, what you see here are characters from a game, a very popular game, tens of millions of players. Actually, I think 125... 25 million players a month kind of log in to play this kind of game. So we're dealing with, you know, just a very large population of players. And when you start playing the game for the first time, you don't have anything. You have what's called a default skin. So basically it's a generic uniform, uh, depending on, on uh, how you're starting out and who you're playing as. And this actually um, became a way to bully new players. You would call them defaults. And it's because they haven't done anything yet. They haven't purchased or earned other kinds of clothes that they can wear in the game. Now, these skins, now, okay, so you've got a generic you know, skin here. And then as you play or as you spend actual real world money, you can start to play dress up. Now, these costumes, these weapons, whenever you buy skins, whenever you trade for skins, uh, whenever you earn skins through gameplay, they're cosmetic only. They don't help you in any way. They just make you look cool. And so, uh, you know, these are just some examples here from Fortnite. Um, you know, other examples of skins from other games. This is just wildly popular across the spectrum, especially when you're dealing with games that feature a community of players. Uh, so here's something from League of Legends. Um, you probably heard of the game Minecraft. And so this is just an example of all of the different skins that, or some of the different skins that you could have in Minecraft. Again, the same model, but dressed up differently. And these are cosmetic features. Um, popular game Overwatch and Overwatch 2 uh, from Blizzard Entertainment. And I wanted to pause here for a moment because you can look um, at the menu on the left and it shows you all of the different skins that are available for this particular character. And the different colors are different rarity. So blue is not so rare. Purple is called epic. Uh, orange is called legendary. And you'll notice that the higher up you get, all of a sudden things start to cost money. And so these games have their own in-game currencies and we'll be taking a look at that as well. And so if you wanna look cool like Symmetra here, you can actually pay for a particular buff, in this case, Oasis, and you'll get that cosmetic skin, which basically tells other players that you are awesome, that you're amazing, or at least you have a good bank account. Um, so how do these translate to real world costs? Um, a lot of these skins are super popular and super rare, and people will actually pay real world money in order to buy clothing and weapons and accessories to make you look cool in a game. In this case, for a, a video game called PUBG, um, you, which is a player unknown battlegrounds, um, you know this is on the market right now for thirteen hundred dollars US, uh, not fake currency, but real money. Um, here's a frying pan with an olive branch logo, and you can see that this is available. I think for around eighteen hundred dollars. Um, a white hat. Now this is all digital stuff. You know these aren't real things. These are all digital things that are trading in the real world economy um, through video game engines and marketplaces. So this hat is currently going for $15,000 US. And then actually last week, as I was putting this, uh, this past week, as I was putting this uh, presentation together, um, this particular skin for this weapon um, sold for $400,000 US. Um, and I equate that to like paying for, you know, $10 million in this case for the $1,794. Uh, it's, it's a similar kind of thing where it becomes, as the kids say, a flex, you know, you have the money, you're going to buy the shiny thing because you can afford it. And then you're going to show everybody that you own it. And not only does that demonstrate who you are and gives you clout in the game that you're playing, whether it happens to be numismatics or, or in this case, uh, uh, video games, it's, it's it's a way for you to you know, just show you know how much that you have and and this this 
this concept is as old as time and as old as, old as, <laughs> as people have been around. So um, taking a quick look at those skins is like, okay, so what's the big deal? And if you people are really playing with this stuff, um, uh, understand that a, a lot of these players, especially for games like Fortnite, for example, these are kids, um, you know, six, seven, eight years old, going up through teenagers. Um, I still play because I think it's fun and it's part of my research. So I'm actually playing for science, if you can believe it. Um, but uh you know, kids don't have a lot of control and they don't have a lot of agency. And so where do they have control and agency? And it's, it's in the games that they play. And, you know, while, you know, they can't necessarily, you know, drive themselves to work or buy themselves a car or something like this, what they can do is they can do that in a game. Um, and so a lot of the economy is driven by young people and, and by children, especially. Um, so, where does this come from and what kind of currencies do we have? Um, a lot of the video games now will have one or more in-game currencies um, that you can either earn through gameplay, you can buy with real money um, or a combination of the two, or you can trade for it. Um, one of the popular games is called Animal Crossings uh, New Horizons. And one way uh, that you can actually get coins is by working. So you're playing, but you're also just doing stuff. You're doing tasks in order to get things. And in this case, this in this game, uh, the currency is a, the unit of currency is a bell. So yeah, uh, you're going out and you are digging holes in the ground, you know, as as one might, uh, in order to bring up coins. And in this case, you get bells. And you're you're, you're coming up against something which is kind of a token economy. Um, and I show the cereal box here because people of a certain age, and I. I include myself in this. Um, you used to be able to send in box tops from your cereal boxes to get stuff. So in this case, if I wanted a frisbee, you know, I could I could eat a bunch of quiz, but I could send it out for a frisbee at, with seventy five cents, and the frisbee would come, and then I would have a toy I could play with. Uh, I could take my dog out and give it water and the upside down frisbee and stuff like that. Well, not so much in the video game economy. You don't get stuff. You don't get anything physical or tangible uh, with this. This is all in game rewards um and you're dealing with the token economy so basically like if you went to chuck e cheese for example you would put in real money and you'd get back tokens with the mouse on them you know with with chuck e cheese himself for example and what do you do with that what do you do um so in this case when you're dealing with a, a virtual economy especially with in-game purchases there are a lot of marketplaces that have sprung up that will serve as kind of a currency exchange uh, or a way for you to to buy in-game currency with real world money so in this case here's where you can buy animal crossing bells and you'll notice that the more bells you buy the more us dollars you spend you get start getting bonuses and this is true in a lot of games so overwatch for example yeah pay 50 euros get 5700 5, in in-game currency you know so there there's a, a a benefit a beneficial rate of exchange for the more content that you buy so you're dealing with economies of scale in this case um apex legends uh same thing um <sighs> Let's see, um, even uh, uh, sports games. So you think, you know, maybe, maybe uh, you're dealing with the currency exchanges and stuff for fantasy games, science fiction games and things. No, this is this is NBA 2021 and you can actually buy in-game currency so that you can purchase players uh, so that you can manage your basketball team um, and all of this stuff. And it's all the same mechanic, pay real money, get in-game currency. The more you buy, the more you get. Uh, and it's in the it's in the uh, game developer's best interest to make these deals as advantageous as possible, so people spend more instead of less. Um, and this brings us to probably the most popular currency right now in game, which are V bucks. Uh, v bucks are used in Fortnite, and if you go into a drugstore right now, you can go into you know Rite Aid or CVS, Walgreens or whatever, and you'll see those gift cards just sitting by the register and a lot of times you'll see stuff for v bucks and so you can actually buy these for your niece or nephew or whomever um and they can turn this into currency that they can use, use in games and what do they use the currency for they use it to buy skins they use it to buy emotes uh that is to say you can buy funny dances for yourself you can buy music that you play for yourself for other players to listen to um and I apologize for this graphic. This is the best that I could find online. Um, but what happens is if you're a kid 
and you're feeling peer pressure or getting bullied because you don't have cool stuff in the game, what are you going to do? You need to find money in which to do it. And there are a number of cases, and you can look this up online, where kids have taken their parents' credit cards, they've taken their grandparents' credit cards, they have engaged in uh, gift card scams um, in order to translate that money into in-game currency to buy cool things to show off for their friends. And this happens a lot. Um, and so I'd mentioned earlier that we're dealing with the currency exchange here as well. And I wanted to show you a little bit of value, you know, for what you're getting for your money uh, for different games. So, you know, popular game Bioshock, um, one US dollar translates to 0 0.03 silver eagles. And you actually use silver eagles in this game. This is one of the few instances where you see kind of almost real um, uh, old American currency in video games. So this is just nice to see. Um, in, uh, in The Sims, um, if you've seen A Wonderful Life, and I'm, I'm sure that, that most of you have, uh, you know that there's this one scene where he's talking about simoleons, um, you know, as, 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 as cash, as a, as a slang you know, term for, for, for dollars. And the game The Sims actually uses simoleons as an actual term. And you can see it's got a, its symbol, S over an S. And so 78 simoleons, 70 cents worth of simoleons is $1. Um, the game Fallout uh, use bottle caps as a means of exchange uh, because they don't have money anymore. So they have bottle caps that you find in the post-apocalyptic world. Um, and uh, here's a handy chart to kind of show you what the rate of exchange is. And these rates of exchange do fluctuate and they actually follow real market laws. And I'm going to show you that in a moment too. Um, the uh, the one other thing to remember is that with video games, um, especially the modern ones that have this kind of in-game economy uh, in which players can buy, buy skins, sometimes it's not um, just dollars that are translating to in-game currency. In this case, uh, Samsung last year um, had an agreement with Fortnite so that if a player or a player's parents bought a Samsung Galaxy or bought, you know, bought a phone, bought a Samsung tablet, that they would get a voucher that they could turn into a, a, a really elite skin that you can use in the game. And so this actually translates to about $1,000 US to pay for the hardware to get that stupid code to plug in in order to get... Uh, you know, to, to, to get this uh, cosmetic thing just so that you can show off for your friends in the game. And for a lot of kids, it's it's absolutely worth it. Absolutely worth it. So where does this trading take place? Um, and these are two words that I never thought would go together, uh, but here we are, skin markets. Um, you've probably seen stuff like this before, where it's like, especially if you live in New York City area, you always see signs in the jewelry, you know, the diamond district, or whatever, it's like going out of business, you know, or, you know, we buy, you, we pay cash for gold. And you're seeing this also now translated into a virtual economy. Um, before we get there, um, some of these next slides will look familiar to you. So if you use online auctions for your own numismatic purchasing, um, you know, you'll you'll get the pictures of the coins or the metals that you're buying, uh, the current bid. When's it going to ex when's it going to end? How many bids are happening? What's the lot number? Um, here's another example of just dealing with ancient coins. But then you're seeing similar things happening with virtual economies too. So anybody who's used to buying coins online at auction, for example, or using eBay. Um, this interface is not going to look all that different. You know, in this case, this is super helpful because you can actually see the current value. Um, you can also see, you know, market treatment of the valuation of these different skins. And you can see the, the, that the things, you know, they'll go up and down over time. And, you know, as one might expect, the market can, can often be volatile um, because we're dealing specifically with digital, um, with digital assets. Um, Steam, um, if you, uh, uh, or, 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 or uh, you know, people you love who are playing video games online, especially with PCs, um, Steam is the place to go for buying games and also for buying content for your games. And they have a community marketplace, which is basically like a, a big bazaar where, where people can come in and things that they find or things that they don't need in their own games, they're happy to put up in the marketplace for other people to buy. 
And so you can see what's going on. Uh, and these aren't too expensive. Here's something for 25 cents, 66 cents, 25 cents. And you can see how many of these are available in the marketplace. So in this case, the very first thing um, is uh, you've, you've got, uh, you know, you've got a skin and there are 365,000 other people you know, who have these skins available. So that's, you can see that the market is super competitive and oftentimes oversaturated, which is why it gives value to rare items. Um, so it's like, you know, trying to sell, you know, wheat pennies, you know, from the 1950s, you know, but, uh, you know, people are really looking for, for something special. And so, you know, the market is glutted at the bottom and then at the rarities, they're super hard to find. And that's why they're super expensive. And the same thing is true with the digital economies here. Um, in this case, and this is no joke, folks, uh, if you want to buy a pair of driver gloves, King Snake, factory new condition, you will be paying $13,889.01 US for this. And the marketplaces are competitive. So in this case, I'm looking at something called D-Market, um, which is a clearinghouse for uh, digital assets for video games. And they say, if you buy from us, instead of buying this on Steam, you're actually, or if you sell, if you sell with us, um, and you don't sell on Steam, you're going to be making X dollars more. And so the marketplaces actually compete with, uh, with each other. It's like the New York Exchange would be competing against NASDAQ or something, you know, within the same, you know, U.S. economy. It's, 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 it's kind of nutty, but it, it works. Um, and these marketplaces are everywhere. So we've got something like Game Flip, which is specific to Fortnite. Um, you've got, and again, I hate these combinations of words, skin wallet, uh, so that you can sell things in this particular marketplace, specifically for the game Counter-Strike, which is probably the most popular game in the world right now. Um, skin Baron, and I love this because they're like, it's from Germany, therefore it must be okay. Uh, and so you have all of these, these places to go and sell, all of these places to go and buy. And as a consumer, you know, it's really, you really have to exercise due diligence in order to go through and make sure that things are authentic, to make sure that what you want is available. And then you price shop and you check the markets and everything. And it gets really, really involved for a digital thing that just stays in the cloud. Um, so we've got other, you know, this is a, a Danish, no, sorry, a Norwegian uh, shop for League of Legends. Um, and it all boils down to who is buying and 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 what's happening in the in the the, the human side of uh, of digital stuff. And so, in this case, you can see from the infographic um, that sixty percent, sixty two percent of kids, you know, have bought paid games or they've conducted what are called microtransactions. That is to say, you buy a game on your phone, you buy a game for your console or or your computer, and once you bought the game, that's not where it stops. The developers are really good or perhaps really evil about encouraging you to buy more after you've purchased the game. So if you want more skins, if you want to look cooler, if you want a better weapon, um, if you want, you can you can buy yourself pets uh, that, that live in the game. And so, yeah, I mean, you know, my daughter, you know, she's, she's 19 now, she'll be 20 soon. And she used to buy a lot of this stuff and it was just, you know, it was torture to kind of look at the bank account. And we had to sit down and say, look, stop, <laughs> stop doing this. But for some, for some kids, it's just, no, no, this is super important to them. And that if they have any ready cash, they're going to pay some, for something digital that they can have to use in one of their games, as opposed to, you know, going and buying an ice cream or, or, you know, a bicycle or something like that. No, they're going to spend it on their phones, buying stuff uh, for the games that they're playing on their phones. Um, and so this is a problem and, and you'll see that, you know, people start to age out of this, you know, once they get out of high school, they start going to college, grad school, or they start to get jobs and stuff, uh, this kind of tails off. And so this is one of the reasons why kids are kind of the driving force of the economy, you know, as far as being the buyers and being the key consumers. Um, so what about the trade side? We've got the, we understand who the buyers are. We understand where the marketplaces are. Um, but uh, what's going on with the selling side of things and and the acquisition of especially rare um, skins that can go you know for tens of thousands or in some cases hundreds of thousands of, of real dollars. Um, 
these marketplaces make it really easy for you to get hooked. And they understand fully well that most of the stuff that you're going to have is junk. Um, but because they all take commissions, you know, it's not unlike an auction house, you know, selling numismatic stuff, they'll take their commission off of a sale. So, you know, even if you're selling something and it goes for 10 cents, that auction house, you know, in the skin marketplace is going to get 3% of that, which is still money. And if you're dealing with millions of people selling, that does add up very, very quickly. Um, and so, you know, it's like, okay, and where, and what kind of money, any kind of money. So if you have PayPal, great. If you're on Bitcoin, great. If you have credit cards, great. Uh, they've made it super easy for you to use any kind of, of uh, financial tool um, in order to get what you want, either for buying or for selling. Um, and this is all, this is all legal. Uh, and this is highly unregulated. Um, you know, which is also kind of shocking, but, uh, you know, the people who are making the laws don't necessarily understand how all of this stuff is working. Um, and, you know, if they talk to their kids or their grandkids, you know, they're going to find out real fast. And then maybe we'll see some legislation passed because, um, you know, the government's also missing a bet on, on taxing all this stuff. Um, apologies to the libertarians of you out there. Um, so, it, you know, you're, you're finding these things online and, and then actually there's communities of players who are trying to help other players learn how to get into the game. Um, and so in this case in Steam, you're saying, here's how you do it step by step. It's super simple. And I love this graph uh, and I'll show you that in a moment. Um, but but yeah, you, you have these communities of players uh, just putting the stuff up online and saying, look, this is what to do. Now, the next slide I'm going to show you, here's the graph. So you can actually look at the marketplace. And I know some of the people on the ANS staff during staff meetings are checking their stock balances and seeing what the markets are doing. Um, and these charts look exactly like what you see, you know, when you're when you're on Coinbase or, or you're looking at any kind of market, uh, you know, internet site, and you're just seeing these fluctuations day to day, hour to hour, even minute to minute. And this is what we see here for digital skin transactions too. I have a particular gun that I like or a particular knife that I like or a helmet or something like that. And um, the, uh, you know, it's, it's just, it's, 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 you know, something to behold. Um, so anyway, uh, when you're reading these instructions, you're going to see stuff that looks very familiar to you. If you're trading commodities, if you are trading stocks and bonds, and if you're, even if you're gambling, don't spend more than you can afford. Don't let your emotions take control. So this is all stuff that we've heard before, especially at auction. Um, you know, it's the same stuff. It's just a different medium of things that people are buying. Um, so the other side of things, and I know there's a lot of sides and I'm talking pretty fast, but what I'm trying to say is that even though we're dealing with digital assets, um, you know, in this case, you know, skins that are used in games. Um, these mechanisms are old. You know, you're not seeing anything new happening. It's just a new platform and people have figured out a way to leverage a new and emerging audience, specifically the youth market. Um, one, of the, one of the darker sides of this is actual what's called skin gambling. Um, and in this case, you could take things that you've earned or that you've yourself purchased inside games and you can put them up into a gambling marketplace or a gambling site and you and instead of being treated as actual cash that you're gambling cash no you're you're using skins that have a cash value assigned to them but because you're dealing with digital assets and not actual money the government allows this to go through and happen and so there aren't really any laws about this and so you'll find that that certain companies that certain companies will will uh, allow this other companies have shut this this kind of gambling down and for some um for some of the game companies and for some of the developers of platforms um they love this because it makes them money um despite what's going on to the people underneath and and their savings and you have people you know who'll spend money you know on skins to gamble with and they'll lose it all um, you know, it could be hundreds, it could be thousands of dollars that they lose on a single transaction. And these are games of chance and they're not regulated. Um, you'll find instructions online about how to play. Okay. So what do you do? Get your skins. 
and then you put it into your into your wallet. We'll talk about wallets in a moment. And uh, then you place your bet. If you win, here's what to do. If you lose, here's what to do. And you do that for as long as you can tolerate it. Um, again, super volatile, extraordinary risk uh, for minimal reward, unless you hit it big, which never happens. And that should sound familiar to those of you who go to Vegas or Atlantic City. Um, you know, we talked about wallets for a moment. Um, if you're, and this is where we start to transition into cryptocurrency. Um, and NFTs, we'll talk about those in a moment. But um, you know, if you work with Bitcoin, if you work with Ethereum, um, chances are pretty good that you want to have some kind of hardware wallet to keep this stuff secure, not just online, but have your Bitcoin stored on a removable encrypted device. And so here are a couple of examples. Um, and we're getting into the idea of portable wealth. Now, you know, it used to be that you know you would have you know, a gemstone, or you'd have a coin, or, or, you know, just a watch, and you could carry that around, and, and that has some kind of liquidity. Um, so, you know, it's portable, yet you can carry a lot of cash on you without actually carrying a lot of cash on you. And so you have these hardware wallets, which are kind of the equivalent. You also see this now in the diamond trade. Um, Vault is a company that uh, has IGA graded diamonds that are put into a tamper proof thing. Now, granted, you can still lose this. You know, you can put it in your pocket for transportation, but you can still lose it. You can forget it. And there are actually stories also of people who have um, lost or or thrown out or their spouse has lost or thrown out um, the hardware wallets for Bitcoin. And there's no way to get that stuff back. You have to have the hardware in order to get it there. Um, so, you know, the equivalent, of course, is working with um, uh, crypto wallets like MetaMask, for example, is the popular one that's supposedly secure. Uh, I've got news for you. Anything digital is not secure, no matter how secure you actually think it is. And there's been a student, and I've forgotten her name now, um, uh, as part of her PhD work, she actually managed to decrypt the blockchain. Um, and for those of you who know how blockchains work and how crypto works, uh, that's kind of scary for a lot of people because you're you're basically voiding out that anonymity of the transactions. And so when you're dealing with things like skins in video games, that becomes very attractive to a lot of people because it's a, it's a kind of portable wealth. You can invest in these things. You can flip them. You can buy low. You can sell high. And it's not like a house or a car or jewelry or anything. It's a digital thing. It doesn't take up any space at all. Um, so it's super attractive for that kind of trading. Um, now, this, of course, and for some of those in the audience who've been paying attention and saying, hey, that's a great idea for laundering money, and you'd be right. Um, the, uh, the skin trade uh, at its darkest um, is a great way to launder money, and I'm not advocating for this at all, and there have been crackdowns you know, on this by different platforms as they've decided what's, you know, as they've uh, determined what's going on. I mean, you'll see this on stuff like eBay. You know, you might see a book on eBay that's like two thousand dollars for a twenty dollar book, and you're like, "How is that even possible?" Well, I've got news for you. That book is being purchased by somebody else, and it's being used to launder funds. You put funds into an item, that item gets purchased, and there's no cash transaction. It's all digital, and so all of a sudden, you've got something clean on the other side that you can then take out. Um, people have figured this out with video games, and because the video game skin market is just millions and millions and millions of items. You can easily put something in there um, that is way overpriced, or you can price it as such uh, and then communicate to other buyers in your network around the world that, you know, this is, it's it's just, yeah, it, it happens all the time. Um, and news stories keep coming out about this and there still isn't a lot of legislation. Um, it's starting to pop up in journals. I love this, that the University of Nevada, Las Vegas has a has a journal dedicated to gaming law because, you know, that's where you go, what you do in Vegas, you go and you play games. And this is also now cascading into video game law and legislation as well and what to do about it and how to identify money laundering and, and how to stop it, how to prosecute. Um, and it's extremely difficult, it's still extremely difficult to do and to prove because of the anonymity, um, the uh, uh, encryption of all of these transactions and the sheer volume. 
And you don't have to move like hundreds of thousands of dollars. You can basically launder the money in like hundred dollar bits based on the different skins that you're uh, that you're putting through. So buyer beware. Uh, but if you're a kid, you don't care. Um, you want that skin because it's going to make you look cool and it's going to improve, you know, your respect or your clout in the games that you play. And you don't care where that's coming from, who is selling it. You just want it. And so you're going to buy it without doing research. Um, this uh, then brings us you know, towards um, the final section of this presentation. Um, and we're starting to see you know, with, with the advent of non-fungible tokens or NFTs and the adoption uh, internationally of cryptocurrencies and cryptocurrency exchanges, you know, places like Coinbase and things like uh, Bitcoin and Ethereum, for example, where companies are starting to create video games that are on the blockchain that actually encourage players in, into uh, what's the model is called play to earn and what this means is if you play a game you are actually working for mining cryptocurrencies um, and the gameplay is actually performing what's called proof of work uh, which helps in the mining of, of transactions or in the mining of coins and the verification of transactions through uh, complicated mathematical operations that are obfuscated by gameplay and this all sounds really complicated, and it's actually pretty nefarious uh, when you get down to it. Um, there are loads and loads and loads of blockchain games that are out there right now. And the thing is, they're free to play. You can download a blockchain game for free, and you can start working. And why? Because the more you play, the more cryptocurrency you're mining, not for yourself, but for the company uh for the game developer and whoever's financing that game development we don't know who's financing a lot of this stuff um and so you know when you're playing blockchain games um a lot of times you are uh, uh creating nfts while you play you're creating digital skins and digital assets while you're playing the game that you as the player then have a stake in and you can put those up into marketplaces um so for example there's a game probably the most notorious game right now is Axie Infinity. Um, this is played somewhat in the US, but it's really popular in Asia. Um, and so you'll find that, uh, you know, a lot of folks, especially in the Philippines, they'll play games like this. Um, there, there's not a lot of work. The pay isn't that great for the work that's out there, you know, for, for you know, the normal person. Um, and so they'll go to the internet cafe and they'll play these kinds of games in order to try to strike it rich by finding something that's very rare. Now, take a look at this. Um, look at these things. Um, for example, Angel, which is this kind of kitty looking monster, that last sold for 300 Ethereum, okay? So what does that actually translate to? One Ethereum um, right at, as of yesterday, and I'm going to get my calculator out here, is $1,900 US. So if somebody sold that digital cat for 300 Ethereum, 1943 times 300, that is $582,900, okay? So that makes a lot for the player and the game developer also gets a cut, all right? It's like winning the lottery. Um, like this kid, this kid is in the Philippines and, and he was playing Axie Infinity. He got an extremely rare, uh, figure. He sold it for several hundred Ethereum and he bought two houses for his parents and his grandparents, uh, with those earnings just for, for flipping, for finding and flipping a digital asset. Okay. This happens and the games are getting better. Look at the graphics on this game compared to. Axie Infinity. Okay, here you're dealing with cartoony line drawings. Here you look, you're looking at a game that looks just awesome to play. Something that's photorealistic and futuristic and interesting. Alluvium uh, is still in development, and you'll find this for a lot of blockchain games. Is they're always in development. They never quite come to market. They never really launch because what they're doing is they're getting investors, and you can actually uh, what's called stake claiming, where you're actually paying in to uh to these video games and they take your money um and 
the uh, uh, they just never never finish. They never come to market. And, but they they have so much hype built around them that you can play to earn, that you can make crypto, that you can. And because people are always still in the in the in, in mindset of of being able to flip, uh, you know, crypto and and uh, you know buy low, sell high, especially with the recent markets, um, you know, it's just nuts. And so for a game like Alluvium, that's been in development for about three years now, it's not even an alpha yet. Um, what you can do is you can buy a stake and well, how much is that? Okay, so if you wanna buy a stake in Alluvium and Alluvium is not just the name of the game, they actually have minted their own cryptocurrency and that cryptocurrency is trading currently in places like Coinbase. So you can go to Coinbase and you can trade Ethereum, you can trade Bitcoin, you can trade Dogecoin, uh, and a whole bunch of others. And Alluvium is there in the marketplace and you can buy it. Um, and here's proof, okay? So you can buy Alluvium, uh, market sign is ILV. Well, how much is it? You can buy, well, the market's not so great. Um, one Alluvium is a $55 US. Um, market's trending down. So if you wanna buy, you can buy. Uh, but again, this is proprietary uh, cryptocurrency that is used in the video game theoretically. So you're buying theoretical currency for a theoretical game with real actual money. Um, you can see the market cap right now, um, price fluctuations in the past hour, past day. And what does that translate to? Okay, so one, one alluvium is equal to 0 0.03 Ethereum, which is equal to $55 US. And so you can see, you know, just just how the market is working for these kinds of things. And, you know, for a lot of players and especially for a lot of game developers in these blockchain games, you know, this is a way for them to earn capital to help develop the games that they're trying to put out and to mine cryptocurrency that, that they can then convert when the market is favorable to them. Um, so the, the interesting thing now, and, and to me kind of the horrifying thing is that with blockchain games and with games that use skins that players can buy and trade amongst themselves uh, in a marketplace, that giant uh, publicly traded or AAA game studios, in this case, Ubisoft, if you ever heard of the game Assassin's Creed, for example, um, Ubisoft produces those um, Far Cry um, and they are getting into the NFT game they are getting into the blockchain game um, as well. And they're not dealing with this kind of self-selected marketplace, you know, of, of some players. This is actually going to happen, you know, very soon. And it's happening now for just the general marketplace of uh, players of these kinds of games, where all of a sudden this stuff becomes available. And, and again, it all comes down to monetization of playtime. Uh, which I find uh, to be you know, personally immoral. Um, I think play should be play, and in this case, play is work. And so you've got you know multi-billion-dollar corporations that are putting out these amazing games that have this other darker element to it. You know, for mining cryptocurrency and for having uh, basically child labor who are you know playing these games do the work for them and to make them money. Um, there's been some pushback uh, from the user community. Um, and it's interesting, you know, a lot of players, they'll play and they'll trade skins, but when they see NFT, NFTs, they're like, oh, that's ridiculous, uh, which is kind of funny because the, the skins that they're buying are just cosmetic anyway. Uh, but for, but for, for the game player, um, for most of them, they look at an NFT, uh, which is just a, a piece of digital art and they can't use the art in the game. And so, you know what? What game? What what? What uh, companies like Ubisoft are doing is they're merging the two. They understand why NFTs are not popular, and then they find a way to turn them into skins that can then be used in the game, and they kind of complete that monetization circle at that point in time. Um, and so, you know, what we have here are, uh, you know, it's for for those companies that want to do this, they're doing it. For those players who want to, you know, continue and and and, and play these things. Uh, they are, and, and this trade uh, continues to go unchecked. Um, and so, you know, I know I sound to be seem to be moralizing about this, but but this is a real danger. And and you know, I mean, games are fun, but at the same time, uh, they're you know the the mechanics of them allow you know for for good honest trade, okay. But then, like anything, 
um, you know, with numismatics or, an, or antiquities or, or collecting of any kind, stamps and, and stuff, you know, they're the good guys and they're the bad guys. And, and uh, these marketplaces have both. And so it's like, what do you do? Um, how do you regulate? Uh, do you regulate? Uh, does it self-police? Does it not? Um, and, you know, there's just all kinds of questions at this point in time. And uh, that's where I want to leave it. Um, I wanted to share with you, you know, kind of what a, stuff that I'm working on and things that concern me, because there are a lot of games out there, billions of people, two and a half billion people play games every day, you know, in, in a planet of 8 billion people now. That's a that's that's more than 25 percent of of the Earth's population playing these things and putting money in. And there's a lot of money to be made and a lot of people that can be turned into agents, you know, consensually or not uh, for making these companies money by, you know, working with, uh, you know, within the blockchain specifically um, in uh, in mining this kind of currency and engaging in this kind of trade. So with that, I will stop my presentation let me thank you stop Andrew. My... yeah yeah you know that uh gives me a lot to worry about now with my sixth grade <laughs> so, yeah. you know in fact um one of the things that you said a little bit early on in your presentation about playing for science i uh -huh. think that should be uh <laughs> some, something to put on a t-shirt yeah uh, 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 I'd, I'd like that a lot yeah, I, um, I, 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 I'm more than happy to let you regulate your own questions as uh, <laughs> you're, you're quite adept at all of this. But um, I don't know if you saw in the chat that John Thomason oh, uh, put um, something there. So. Oh, wow. Um, John, I did not know. Um, yeah, RuneScape is another hugely popular game, um, you know, with just millions and millions of players. And I did not know that this particular story. And I do listen to Planet Money sometimes, but I missed this episode um but but yeah i mean this goes back you know doing playtime for monetization um it's uh it, it's 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 not new um you know i used to play world of warcraft um for about five or six years and you would always encounter people who weren't really playing the game what they were doing was they were farming or that is to say mining or in the digital environment and with or they would go on quests they would get gold and then they would hoard all of that and that affected market prices within the in-game economy and then they would flip these um, assets they'd flip the gold that they'd found they'd flip the ore that they'd found and put it on a public marketplace and then sell that for more and um, so you know the term gold farmer or gold farming um came about because people would play the game not to play the game but to make money and to sell whatever they found to other players who are impatient and a lot of the time when you're dealing with gameplay you're dealing with the human need to have something right now you don't want to wait for it you don't want to play a game for 20 hours in order to get something cool you want it right now and if you've got money you might as well just buy it now uh instead of grinding um and so that's uh yeah, this is just another case in point in that kind of behavior. And it's playing on the worst human instinct as well. You know, it's just, you can wait, you can do the work and get your reward. And then for a lot of people, it's like, no, I've got the means, give me the reward now. Um, and, and that's what they do. So the people who develop these games, they know exactly what they're doing and they know the psychology of the people who are buying. Hmm. See if we got any... Any questions or comments from anybody else here? Yeah, I think I, I think I scared everybody. <laughs> and you should be, yeah, but this is happening. And just because it's a video game and just because it's kids playing, yeah, you know, doesn't mean it's not important to us. Um, so, Actually, you know, you know I, I do have a question. How, yeah. how would you regulate something like this, though? Well, I think there are people, brighter minds than me, <laughs> that are trying to figure this out. And I think it comes to not regulating really the, the, the individual transactions or the buyers, but the platforms that are hosting these marketplaces. And it's interesting. There are some blockchain games that are actually, their platforms are hosted in the Caribbean um, for real. And they can be outside of the law 
um, in, in order because they're hosting and they know exactly what they're doing. You know, for companies like Ubisoft, they're based in Canada, for example. And so Canadian authorities could say, OK, you cannot do this, but you can do this. Um, and for some, that might be too much, a bridge too far. And so they'll they'll move it to an island somewhere or they'll go to Venezuela. Yeah, you know, I, I was at a conference in Sweden a couple of weeks ago um, where uh, it, it was looking at the title of it was uh, the trust of value um, means of payment and perspective or something like that. But it was looking at uh, means of payment from the beginnings of money and coinage all the way up to cryptocurrency. And there was a lot of discussion towards the end of that, as you can imagine, about um, both cryptocurrency or say Bitcoin becoming a global universal currency, but then also how do you regulate um, these type of digital currencies at the same time? And you know, there are obviously a lot of parallels, um, you know, with what's going on with these games and and all the rest of that. Because you know, if you have a global, if you know, global environment, um, local laws essentially don't really you know matter as much, and that obviously is part of the point. So. Yeah, and for some that's great, and and for others, yeah, this is a this is a problem. Um, yeah, I don't know. I mean, you you see a regulation, and a lot of private corporations or even public ones are like, whoa, 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 whoa. We see that in America yeah. all the time. You know, no regulations, minimal regulations, because that's stifling the economy, is stifling production and and uh, our, our our product and all of that stuff. And I get it. No, and in fact, that that was one of the arguments made by a representative from FinTech, you know, financial technologies, uh, who you know was essentially in her presentation <laughs> was saying, no more regulation. We don't need regulation. Yeah. Um, um, yeah, I, I don't know if you see yeah, uh, a few things in the in the yeah. chat. So. Um, so yeah, if, uh, Tina, first, thanks for coming. It's good to see you. Um, and uh, I, I have not been following the Netherlands cases uh, for loot boxes. Um, for, for for those of you who don't play games um, or especially online games like Overwatch, um, these games have basically, you know, people like presents. And they like finding treasure and they don't know what it is until you open the treasure chest, until you open that wrapped package. And so these games have those packages and presents wrapped up and ready for you to open. And used to be uh, until, you know, some of the game developers grew a conscience um, is that uh, you could sell these loot boxes online for certain sums. And then I, as a buyer, could pay you $500 and get a thousand loot boxes and just go through and open all of them to see if there's anything rare. And if there's something super rare, I can then take that and put it onto the marketplace myself, recover my money and make a profit. Um, and so I'm guessing that this is also, this is the legal case, uh, you know, to which Tina's referring, but this also, you know, has been happening in the U.S., you know, through, you know, some regulation and pro prosecution and the like, and it forced some of the uh, uh, game developers, like in this case, Blizzard Entertainment, to change how things are doing. So there are no more loot boxes and there's no more loot box trade in Overwatch 2, and they retired Overwatch, which had that mechanic in it. And when I say mechanic, that means it's just a way of doing things, uh, something that is part of a game that you can use. Um, so the uh, uh, so Peter has a question about uh, the rarity of digital objects as being something artificial and has it produced and controlled. Um, the game developers will create algorithms um, that uh, produce something in gaming talk, it's called a drop rate. Um, so if I kill a monster, I know that that monster has a 10% chance of dropping something cool or an 80% chance of dropping something that's garbage. And so I'll go fight that monster because I hope to get that 10% drop. Um, and then for, you know, for playing multiplayer games, you might have really strong monsters and you have to play as a group in order to defeat it. And then it drops that cool thing, but then the five people have to figure out who gets it because it's not one for it's not one for everybody it's one for the team and so you know they have to vote on it or they roll a dice to to, to get it but the these algorithms you know have a very low percentage for these very rare items and that's one way that rarity is is done the other bit of rarity um, is actually market controlled because the market might desire something and if that is not present in the marketplace they're going to go after that thing because it's you know, there's not a lot of representatives of that particular digital asset that they want to go and get. Um, some of these artifacts are actually gifts to game developers who are part of the development team. 
you know, so that white hat that I showed you at the beginning for 15,000, that was never given to players. That was given to code writers in that game who were part of that particular project. And some of them decided they didn't want that. They wanted to cash out. So they put that on the marketplace. And because there are only like five of those hats available, that's why they cost so much. And because you cannot get this as a player, it's coming out of the game development studio itself that adds value also. And so, uh, um, uh, and then I see that Mike had a comment about grading these things, then putting them into, you know, slabbing your digital assets. You know, you might laugh, <laughs> but um, there are ways that you can actually tie your digital assets to your accounts so that you can prove ownership. And this is why the blockchain is really appealing with digital, dealing with these digital assets in a digital marketplace. So, you know, if you have a Bitcoin or if you make a Bitcoin transaction, you get that long string of numbers and letters that are associated to you. There's a public key and a private encryption key as well. And that just proves that you have, you have this thing. And so they have this now for some of the digital assets in some of the games or if you craft something in a game, so if you're playing World of Warcraft, you craft something, you can give it a name, it can be tied to your account, and whenever you sell that, that name follows it around the marketplace so people can see where it came from, who made it, and that adds value as well. Did you see the comment there from Chuck Oliver? Yeah, I, I do, and he's, and he's right. Um, uh absolutely I, I would i would love to see this as a frontline <laughs> program on pbs to talk about the skin trade um skin trade you know it has been covered by the media pretty well over the past few years but it hasn't really changed much um some of the companies have have changed or have been forced to change but you know and not a lot and so you know certainly i think it's because the people who are who are passing the laws making the laws just don't either don't know about it they don't see you know what's happening or if they do you know they haven't a clue about what to do about it um so you know as as our zoomer generation comes up you know i have a feeling we'll see that change some more but right now uh not so much and so uh tina has a comment in there about loot boxes are now being seen as gambling in many european countries so illegal under 21 years old and so fifa if you play the soccer game or if you know fifa from watching world cup recently um, they have a very successful um, suite of games published by Electronic Arts um, that are really, really, really fun to play and super popular. And they have their own trading card system as well so that you can have NFT trading cards. I think there was run with Cristiano Ronaldo that went for a million bucks or something because it was that rare. But in any case, um, yeah, uh, you can gamble with these things. And so international laws are being passed to keep people you know from from gambling on these loot boxes or these blind bags as you can also call them um you know for this for this stuff um and, and tina's right enforcement is really hard we could see it going on but you're dealing with millions of people every day all day long engaged in these transactions and where do you even start uh, i think that's the hardest part starting with the platforms may be the way to go but you know that's a lot of red tape and a lot of lawyers for a long time. You know, I, I, Daniel Wolf also had a comment here, said yeah. uh, it sounds like a commodities market with various imaginary derivatives and non-deliverables, which, you know, actually made me thinking as, as a curator, how would you actually curate, you know, any of this, um, you know, the longevity, I mean, the potential longevity of this just seems not. It's, oh my God. Yeah. It's, it's super fragile and super volatile. And, you know, diamonds are forever. So, you know, a diamond is a diamond is a diamond. I might lose it, but it's still there. Yeah. Um, you know, you, you've got a game like Alluvium and you might, you know, be a stakeholder and you've put in a few hundred dollars to get a stake in this. And then hopefully you'll be able to cash out some Ethereum later on, depending if the market is still going. And that company could just fold up a blow away and take your investment with it um, yeah. at any time. And all of this stuff, all of these digital assets, all of these skins, you know, for your armor, for your weapons, for your vehicles, your pets, and all of this stuff in the digital space, that company's gone and they take it with it. You know, it, it's, there's nothing permanent here, which is why it makes it a great medium of transaction. I put money into this digital thing. You buy the digital thing for more than I paid for it. I get your cash, you get the thing, and then I'm done. 
And that's how a lot of it's being done right now. They understand that this stuff is impermanent. Um, and so yeah. it's great for fast transactions and to move money around mm. without being traceable very well, very easily. And on that very happy, positive note, um, we're at the top of the hour. Um, <laughs> Andrew, I'd like to thank you again. That, that was sure. uh, fantastic. Really um, learned a lot. And like I said, gives me a great deal to worry about now. So uh -huh. thank you for that, too. So, yeah, yeah. Um, hope, um, hope you guys don't have nightmares tonight. Um, yeah. I sure do. <laughs> so,